<coughs> Greetings, welcome to number three of Tech Arcana. And today's topic is macros, uh, writing the uh, control sequences. Oh gosh, I don't know how to start. Yes, you have a question that'll help me start. <laughs> this, this is just about the homework you gave out yesterday. Right. In problem four, where you're supposed to be plotting points, where do, you want, where do you want the origin placed? Well, um, that's, yeah, that's ambiguous. So in the program that I wrote, I just, uh, I think I assumed that it was, that the points were given in units of VU, and then I, I used some arbitrary thing so that this one would, would work out. It wouldn't go off the left of the page. Um, so I, move, so I, I moved it in an inch or something from the left margin and then then I went down about five about th four or five inches from the top of the page and, and I and I cropped it uh, uh, to you know make this handout I, I just took the took a scissors and um, pasted a bunch of things together so um, you just, could make that specifiable by a user if you wanted to but it's but it is certainly ambiguous uh, and if, it, if, it, if you have the wrong origin it just uh, this will print somewhere out in limbo. I just <clears throat> arbitrarily placed it at the center of the page. But I didn't. I didn't make my macro figure out that it would fall on the page and adjust accordingly. That would have been a little more complicated. Thank you. All right. We'll talk a little more about these problems that anyone's having with the problems uh, after I get started. Okay. Now, control sequences um, give you. Um, an enormous amount of power. Uh, it's almost impossible to conceive of, the, of, of what you can do with these control sequences, um, even though they, the definitions are comparatively simple. The chapter of the tech manual about control sequences has this one uh, weird example that shows you pretty much about everything, uh, the, what the basic rules are for, for matching the parameters, getting started, and, um, and then how substitution gets done. And you go through different phases. First, you think control sequences are very simple, and you'll use them only to, to make an abbreviation for a, a dozen characters or so. And then you start to see that you can actually do, um, uh, you can use control sequences to save information and not really, the user never uses the control sequence, but the, just the macros use control sequences to, to communicate between macros between output routine and the main program and so on. Um, and then you come to the situation where, where you're thinking control sequence can do everything. Then all of a sudden, the, the thing won't expand at the right time, or it will expand at the wrong time. And you'll, and you'll begin to, to, to figure out that it won't be able to do anything. And you have to fight with them a little bit in order to get them. Now, that's, uh, that's a little bit unfortunate. On the other hand, that's part of the game. And uh, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, uh, that sometimes keeps me busy for for several hours, and I can't say that those several hours are are are, are pure joy. But but having solved the problem afterwards is is fun. Now uh, the main thing though was I wanted to have something where you could define the rules for control sequences briefly and write the code in a in a small amount of time. Uh, that wouldn't wouldn't the, that that implementation wasn't too much, and I got a lot more than I than I expected I would get. But I, but I don't. Uh, um, on the other hand, I, I, I don't claim to have the, the world's best uh, macro package in, in, in tech yet. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's an incredibly high-pitched squeal coming back here. That was done. That was coming it's through. And it's. It's going to be. It's, it, it came on and off again. That, Yes. <laughs> Did anyone hear what I said about control sequences? <laughs> yes, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> like on D Doctor Strangelove. Okay, um, so so um, then you f you realize that some of the facts about control sequences aren't as simple as we thought they were, and that uh, the rules for exactly when things are expanded and aren't are a little bit implicit. Um, and uh, I, I have to admit that sometimes I get surprised at what, at what happens. And this is true of every macro package that I know. 
um, that is uh, you start out thinking that it's a rather simple thing and then you start start looking at how powerful it is and you see the combinations of things that you can't imagine what it's going to do and uh, uh, the uh, thing is is unambiguous but in its own funny ambiguous way and so macro packages uh, I think have historically always included a way for you to trace and find out what it's doing uh, so that you can really figure out these these inscrutabilities now that's um, uh, something of what I want to say today that is uh, uh, how we can how we can coerce the the uh, macro package to do what we want it to last week I mentioned the uh, the two phases of text input uh, which I called the mouth and the stomach and uh, the mouth is the part that eats w the things out of a f out of the text files and, and and things that you type in after a star prompt on your terminal and the um, the stomach is the part that actually t sets type and does the the, uh, the the semantic action. So you could also consider the syntax in semantics. The mouth part of tag uses these um, it classifies everything it reads from a file or the terminal as one of 14 things numbered 0 to 13 and, the, and this code. Uh, associates a number from 0 to 13 with each of these characters. Uh, this is done at the time that the, the f that at the time the thing first goes into the mouth. So whatever the values of the codes are at that time governs what the uh, mouth is doing to them. Um, and once they're classified that way, that classification stays. So. For example, when you define a control sequence, the, the, the escape character that was in effect after the word def uh, was read is the one that, it, that, that identifies the, the, the thing after the def to be a control sequence. Um, all the other, uh, the, the, the code, uh, uh, a left brace that follows that, um, uh, again, has to be recognizable as a left brace character. It doesn't have to be a left brace symbol. It just has to have code three or whatever. Yeah. So if you have defined, say, a backslash to be your escape character, you read in a certain, you, with a macro, you read in a certain escape sequence while backslash was the escape character. You passed it into another macro, which redefines escape to be a normal printing character. There's no way to, that still will be a... That's it's still a, a control sequence with the same name. And there's no way to explode that apart. Is that right? You, you can change that. Once it's gone into the mouth, it's been classified. The control sequence has been stored And you can't away. break it apart into letters. You can't explode it. No, no. You want to explode it into letters, you, you can send it to a file. Okay. And, and the send statement will, will put it on the file, and then you could read that back in from the file again. But that's, that's, uh, but, inside, but that's the only way the stomach can get back to the mouth is through the... Is Thank through you. The, uh, uh, is, because the mouth will only... The classification process... Has 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 done it. Okay. Um, now, uh, for example, if someone says "deaf," uh, uh, okay. Let me let me show you what I did in, in, in the tech manual itself in order to in order to print uh, in order to print sort of arbitrary strings of text. Can we have this on, uh, Can we have this on the on the screen? Um, I I defined. Uh, a macro that was backslash equivalent sign and the beginning of that macro started out with various things that would that would change codes so I would I, I changed code of uh, I don't know what these numbers are but I think 44 is an, is a is a dollar sign for example and I changed that back to a 12 which means other characters so now this says that uh, henceforth when the mouth sees something if after this definition has taken a place, then, well, then the mouth will classify a dollar sign as uh, uh, 12. This isn't very well focused on my screen. I don't know if you can see it any better. And I changed all the other things. I, I, I changed back all the other things, too, so that, they, that, so that everything I typed would be like another character, except I needed one escape, one way out. And so I, 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 I changed, you know, the left braces and everything were changed so that they wouldn't be... Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I could type later on in my text. I'm typing uh, something like this. I put a left brace, and then I started this control sequence, and then I would type some random text, like in, in input basic, or I could say, you know, let 
um, I, it, tech would not interpret this as, as anything special. It would be just text inside of this uh, equivalence mode. On my keyboard, equivalence was a nice symbol to use. And so you could say, uh, well, let me, I don't know what the example I should use here. I could say def um, uh, of, of this almost. <laughs> no, not quite. Um, def of, um, of uh, a to be something or other. Okay, so this right brace, left brace wouldn't be a, the same as a right brace. I could, I could say in my text, if I just wanted to, to refer to a left brace all by itself, I could refer to a left brace. And then I, I got out of that by saying equivalence backslash and, and, and coming back in, it looked sort of symmetrical. Okay, and um, so I could print a left brace in that font by by typing this. This is the way I set up my macros to do it. So, so there was this little ritual that I type these three characters, then I have verbatim, and then I have the three characters to come out. Um, except there, was, there had to be one way to get out again, and so I also t t coded the, um, uh, the equivalent symbol uh, to be a, an escape character, and I wouldn't allow myself to type equivalent symbols in here. So this equivalent symbol is the escape character, all right? So I, so I don't know what the code for equivalence is, but let's assume for lack of, for, you know, without loss of generality, that's 23. Uh, and I think uh, the escape character is type zero. So I, I, I changed that to zero, let's say. And then I also selected a, the typewriter font, and, and uh, I think that was the, and, well, I, I defined a few other, uh, I also had in here, I think, a couple of other definitions. Uh, uh, for example, I, I think I, I defined um, uh, less than or equal to be a, to be su superpose a, an underline onto a uh, less than sign because in the typewriter font it doesn't have a less than or equal and so if I had to define a few special things like that in case I wanted to get a less than or equal into my example so I defined a few a few other symbols now notice that in this definition I'm using backslash still as the escape character. I'm not, you, you know, here I, I, I changed the code of backslash, whatever it is, to, to be type 12, uh, backslash to be, type, to be type 12, but I'm still using it as an escape character in, in this def and everything else. The reason is that this check code hasn't taken effect. This, this is just a piece of text. This is a control sequence to code uh, and, a, and an apostrophe and so on, but this definition is being, is, 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 the mouth is just reading this in, uh, using its present meanings of all the symbols. It's not acting on this stuff. It's just reading it in, storing it away. Now, there's, uh, now actually what happens to a control sequence after it gets classified by the mouth, it gets, um, it gets uh, stored in the, uh, you know, I, I can't really call it the brain, but uh, we could call it the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the nervous system anyway. Uh, so tech somewhere how has, has these, in, has this, this long string of, of text with everything classified um, into each token, one, one thing at a time, a token like uh, this, is, this, this has been classified as one token, um, and it's a particular pointer to a place uh, in the in text memory that, uh, that uh, is associated with that control sequence. Um, if we redefine that control sequence, the, the new definition will take place when I refer to that part in the memory. Uh, this is a character, this is a character, this equal sign, all of these are, uh, this would be a digit. Um, uh, I think it's classified though as another character that's just recognized to be between 0 and 9. Uh, so it hasn't been classified as any, you know, all, the 1 is just there as a 1. It doesn't, doesn't, um, the mouth doesn't convert that into a number 12. It just takes as a 1 followed by a 2. Um, <clears throat> so, all of these things are just uh, are, are stored away as a long list according to the classifications that were in effect at that time. Then I also define uh, backslash backslash afterwards, and this is um, the one that's eventually going to be equivalence backslash when the when the uh, when equivalence becomes the escape sequence. This is this the control sequence that escape followed by that backslash. See, so so that's going to be the one that, that does everything that I that I have to do uh, when coming out. Now, um, is there anything I have to do when coming out? Just by just by getting out, I have to be able to. I think what I do is I I, I change the code of the right brace 
uh, back again, which is different on different ASCII codes, but it, at sale it's, it's 176. And I changed that back to a right brace, which I think is two or three. I forget what the code is. These codes were never made mnemonic, I'm sorry. And, and then that's all. That, that's all this control sequence does. It's enough for it to recognize the right brace. I think I need a space here. Uh, it's enough for this to recognize, because otherwise it'll scan the right brace to see if it's part of the number. And while it's scanned that right brace, it still thinks it, it hasn't changed the code yet. So I need a space here in order to give the stomach time to, to get the, the information. Um, okay, but, soon, but after that is true, then the right brace is, is, is enough to be recognized, and then that'll end the group and all these other chocodes will go away. So I don't have to uncode everything, just, just, just get out of that group, okay? But that's about the way these, these control sequences work, and I think it gives you some idea as to how the, how the, 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 the value of chocodes at, at the time the mouth gets it is the, is the, is the, is the uh, important thing. Once the mouth has parsed it into, a, into one of its uh, tokens, uh, uh, classified it, then it stays that forever after. Um, mouth also is the one that, that knows the rules about when to put par in for a blank line, when to uh, ignore several spaces in a row, and so on. That's all, that's all based on the classifications of these characters. Um, if you put the definition of backslash, backslash within the text of backslash equivalence, so that it would, yeah, that wouldn't have hurt. Would, that wouldn't have hurt. That would, yeah, fact, that would that free would, up the backslash that would, backslash. That would, say, that would free up backslash backslash as a, as, a, as a macro that I could define. It's a kind of a handy one to define because it's so easy to type. Uh, you can hit the key twice, and so uh, so that's right. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I could put that in there, and uh, and uh, that would have been better. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, so then the um, then the stomach takes takes effect and the um, stomach there is a little bit of communication to the uh, uh, that goes on in between the mouth and the stomach and that is every once in a while some of these stored stored definitions are regurgitated or whatever you want to call it uh, that they come back through uh, because you, you have to expand a control sequence it's time for the stomach wants to read something, but it has to get it not from the source text, but, but it's interrupted by a control sequence. And so you get in the middle of a control sequence, and that calls in another one that has to be was user defined and has to be expanded. And so you get uh, 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 a stack of, of, of things inside of other things and in, inside of other things. Um, sometimes, in fact, tech will read it, will read and, and decide it didn't, it didn't really want that one, and it's going to read it again. Uh, like when it's looking for a dimension, or it's looking ahead to see if you wrote PLUS to see if, you, if there was any, any stretching in, in a glue. And, and maybe the text said PLUD or something like that, or PLU uh, anything else. And then tech will, will, will say, oops, that wasn't plus, uh, there was no glue here. Um, put it all back and, and it comes again. So, some of the, so sometimes it has to back up over, over symbols that it's read and give them back to you again. Then, um, so so um, uh, besides, uh, one of the things that, that, that can appear is the word input, and that will start reading from another file, in which case uh, uh, the mouth will have to, have to actually do the contact with the file. So you have this big stack of things coming on input. At the lowest level is the terminal, then, uh, then probably a file and then probably some control sequence, and some control sequence maybe something that was backed up, and then maybe another input from a file or something. This can, uh, this can get rather, uh, rather high. Um, uh, it, it, right now it can get up to 80 levels, um, and the human mind apparently can only handle about seven at a time, according to Ingvi's depth hypothesis. Now, now this uh, um, uh, is the way the input gets to the stomach. Now the stomach is where all the semantics takes place, including, including if. And this is what's a little bit uh, 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 disconcerting at times, and that is that things like if and all the other tests that that you have here and then else um, are done in the stomach and not en route to the stomach. And so that means that you that the the word if will not be recognized unless uh, the, uh, uh, it, it will not be interrupted in the midst of something else. Um, suppose you're trying to scan for a, a number or a, uh, or a dimension or something like that, and the word if comes along. It won't, that won't work. You can't 
you can't say if something then points else millimeters or something and put that after 15 and again expect to get either 15 points or 15 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> uh, I believe that's true, isn't it? I think you can't do that. I think it because you. That's right. It'll put points in for you, and then you get an error message saying uh, unknown dimension when you got to the word if. You see, so if is at a little awkward place there. It's only ready. It's tech is only ready for it when it's ready to to see what's going to go next into one of its lists, <clears throat> not when it's scanning for for uh, for funny things like that. So what you have to do is instead you 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 x def a uh, I mean, no, you, you, you define a um, uh, uh, control sequence in a way that gets expanded <laughs> at a time when tech is ready for the expansion that will come out either points or millimeters. And, and so you would define the control, so you, you would, would put before the, the, before the A skip, you would say, define a, uh, you, maybe GDEF a control sequence to be if something then points else millimeters. And then you use that GDEF control sequence afterwards. So the idea is that uh, if you, it, when if is done at the wrong time, we usually have to um, have to have to put the result of of of, of the if in the, into a control sequence uh, in, in the middle here, you, and and typically with a with a GDEF of, uh, of of the result of something or other to be whatever you wanted to do in that case, and then GDEF on the other case, what you want to do in the second case. And then uh, GDEF res. And then afterwards, you can call res, and that will expand uh, at the right time. Uh, so, ex so if won't expand when, when, as, a, as a control sequence will. If is, is done only by another part of the stomach. Now, this has um, uh, some disadvantages when you're designing macros that you have to keep track of it. But there seems always to be a way of getting, getting around it. Um, and it, uh, the advantages of it are that, when, that uh, um, uh, in various uh, contemplated extensions to tech, they won't have they, they won't all have to handle the the uh, 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 the, the every if that that exists in the system. So they only have to handle a few of them, something like that. Anyway, I thought it was an advantage at one time. Now, <clears throat> um, so so the difference between the the mouth and the stomach is is important to, to have in mind, and that those are the best analogies I can think of. Um, this will arise in in connection with problem five, five or six um, of your of your exercise, number six, I think it was, um, in a strange way. That is, if you do it, if you do by by one obvious approach, in the end of the list. Um, uh, after you've put out a carriage return into into your list, then then uh, your macro might expand into something that has an if to test whether the whether you, whether the recursion is done, whether the, whether you're at the very end of the list, and it'll turn out that uh, what happens in an alignment after the word carriage return, tech looks ahead to see if the next character is no align or not, and if it's no align, then it will stop the alignment. However, if the word is if, the assumption is that it's not no align. And that there's going to be something there which then has to be followed by a carriage return. So then it will tell you that you're missing a carriage return after your if uh, there. And uh, that's a, that. Um, and in fact, this if will also get stuck into the middle of your alignment uh, on the next row. So um, uh, this uh, needs to be anticipated in your solution to problem six. And that's uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I gave that problem. <clears throat> Okay, I talked about the difference of that sort. Let me let me uh, go, let me see what else I wanted to mention. Um, XDEF was something that was added after I, I, I started the very first the fir very first um, uh, versions of tech had DEF and GDEF, and I found I needed GDEF because of cases like this. I couldn't just use a DEF here. Um, if I use a DEF here, does anyone see what's going wrong? Because this is all done in the stomach, yeah, you got it. Uh, put the microphone. The definition would disappear once you leave. The definition goes 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 away when it hits the right brace, because the right brace and end of a group is also done by the stomach, and uh, and the right brace says go back until you find the corresponding left brace and then figure out what what routine you were in, um, and then it sees it was doing an if. 
And so the def had disappeared by that time, any defs in there. So, so I needed definitely a G def to get, to get out. Um, a similar thing, I think, possibly in an output routine, um, although that I flipped on that once. Uh, I, I'm not sure if the output routine is really considered to be inside of a right brace or not anymore. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, I don't remember, but um, GDEF is, is, uh, is something that uh, uh, w was necessary to mean that some control sequences would, would be uh, used at, considered only at uh, outer, outer level and not, not redefined. Now, XDEF was something that I had to add a few months later when people started to use macros more heavily than I had originally intended when I, we started to realize that they were of some use and this is this is um, so so here we have a control sequence and then we and whatever text is put in here the macros are expanded this just means that the that um, um, it's as if uh, it, all the processing that is done that takes things to the stomach but an if will not be expanded at this point the same for the same reason if does, an if in here stays that stays an if um, so if this is a if this is a recursive if you, if you call a recursive macro inside of here that has ifs in it, it it's going, you're going to get in trouble. It's not going to expand that recursive macro to the, to the right number of times in the xdef. That doesn't happen. Um, so that's a limitation that you'd have to solve another way uh, by finding some part of tech that's, that's consuming uh, the, the text and then, and, and st then getting that in. Um, but xdef won't do it. Um, now. Uh, let's see. Another thing that uh, so xdef usually is just a simple simple usage of the thing, and the only thing that that, that in of course for for grand wizards like the people in this audience, I have to mention some of the things that that if you want to make a long xdef and do something really strange, this is a way to expand a control sequence uh, pretty much, except without the, the words if the ifs. Um, one of the things sometimes people say, well, why? Uh, what if I have a control sequence in here I don't want to be expanded? Um, so there was a non-expand uh, in there, and, I, and, and it had been defined to be a user or something. And I, but I wanted to xdef, and I wanted to expand everything but, but, that, but that one. Well, how can, I, how can I do that? Well, as far as I know, there's two solutions to that problem. Um, one of them is, is uh, uh, to precede non by a word like x quote or something like that. And before you did the x def, you define x quote, or no, you say let x quote equal def. Now, during, while you're expanding something in an x def, it, it, it doesn't define, it doesn't expand any control sequence that follows, follows a def. And so if I said let x code equal def for the time being, then, then non is following def. And so it's not, uh, this is really, this let uh, uh, has, has, has said that the meaning of this control sequence is exactly the meaning of def. And so it's that type. And so it won't expand a, a control sequence following the word def. Uh, then after the x def has taken place, then you can, can define x quote to be, uh, uh, to be null. And then, it, then, then its effect will, will go away uh, when you actually read this, because it'll get expand to null, and, and I think it'll work okay. Um, now, the other solution is, <laughs> if you don't understand even the problem, then, then don't worry about it. I'm not going to dwell on this for long. The other solution is to, to define um, uh, save non, uh, uh, or let, I'm sorry, let save non equal non. And this, this means that anything that non was uh, is now saved in save non. And then you say let non equals just about any primitive. Like you could let it equal let. Anything that won't get expanded, any primitive at all. So then when non appears in here, it'll look like, it'll look like uh, an un, unexpandable thing, and uh, it, will, uh, it will then appear as non. And then afterwards, you can let non equal save non and, and get back again. And so that's another way to, uh, to pr prohibit expanding of that guy inside xdef, okay? So, so um, uh, the main moral of this story is though, that sometimes you get in trouble if things are expanding when you don't want them to, they aren't expanding when you do want them to. And, and um, the hardest thing would be 
to find a case where the stomach is actually wants to to find a to find a case where the stomach is going to want to cons uh, to, to uh, expand a recursive macro for you. And uh, one of the best cases of this is that is after the word if you can put if you can uh, the, the the routine that looks at the two characters following the word if is is a big consumer in the stomach and it'll expand everything until it gets uh, until it gets two characters out and so. Uh, and so that uh, uh, will will uh, do some expansion, I think, for you. Maybe not. <laughs> no, no. I'm sorry. You can't get ifs in there. Oh well. Push back again. I can see. Uh, once I did it through marks. I think there are ways to to get around every problem, but uh, sometimes uh, I haven't got a general solution to them all. I'm sorry to say. I, in fact, the subtleties of this problem. Are somewhat overwhelming, and uh, but I think John Backus did solve them once uh, after spending five years on on the problem of how to define such uh, languages. And uh, if I live long enough, I'm going to learn how he did it. Uh, now, <clears throat> let's see. I talked about that X quote and um, codes. Now. Oh yeah, one time that people wanted to get the macro to expand was in a preamble of an H line. This one. Um, suppose we've defined a control sequence to be a preamble that says this is the way to do a, um, um, a three-column format. So you would say, so so they wanted to say H line of three-col carriage return. Now, what when when the H line routine is reading is reading this preamble. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, actually, it doesn't expand all the contr control sequences at that time. In fact, it would be kind of dangerous if it would, because a lot of times in the preamble there are things like center, left bracket, star, and and um, uh, you can imagine a, a macro that would actually use its argument and duplicate it several times, and then you'd have several stars in that preamble. Doesn't doesn't work too well. So generally speaking, H-line just scans right through this until it gets to, in, and, it's, and it no, knows only the sequence of the, the um, things that are type carriage return or a, a tab mark, and everything else is just filed away into a list that's going to be that's. Uh, and oh yeah, it also knows this symbol, and so like if if it was H-line center of something, then. Uh, it's, then it saves away this part of the text to, to be put in front of whatever you type in that column, and it saves away this part of the text to put after whatever you, 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 you type in the column, and and uh, and it marches on to the uh, to the next entry until so it gets to a carriage return or something else. So how are you? But so uh, you get into trouble if you really wanted to expand. Uh, if the three call was was defined to be equal to center, you know, uh, you know three three centers separated by by. Um, tab marks, something like that. Okay, well, there is a way to expand that, and I'm sorry to have to admit it, please don't tell too many people, but you say in front of this tab skip zero point. Now, the other thing that HLine has to look for as it scans the preamble is changes in the amount in the tab skip. Tab skip is changing, uh, would change the amount of glue that goes between columns. And and if I and so when it sees tab skip, then it starts to then it starts to go through the regular routine to scan for dimensions, to scan for, uh, to scan for glue, and so it'll have to look for the word plus following this dimension here, and so it has to expand three column to see if it starts with the word plus, <laughs> all right, and so three column will get all expanded and everything will work beautifully, okay, so that's the solution to that problem. So there are ways of getting things to expand. Sometimes they expand uh, a little bit that uh, you don't realize they're expanding. At the end of a number, if, if you if you're saying if you any any uh, example where you're giving a number, like even Chakode um, of something equals uh, 12, and then if the next word to that is def, well, Tech had to look ahead. Uh, uh, at the next symbol following two to see if that was going to be a, a, another digit. Okay. Now it it um, it actually would have if that was a control sequence that control sequence would have got expanded then and there it would have read ahead to look at all its arguments it might have gone through set many lines and 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 read down the down the page a long ways just because it's trying to find if there's another digit after that too before the stomach gets you know before before that part is found then then uh, 
in order to just scan the word deaf, though, and before there wasn't another control, whatever control sequence it was, well, you also had to look to see whether the end of that control sequence occurred. You had to, you know, you, you don't just stop at the D, you have to keep looking ahead. And so um, the symbol following deaf has already been classified by the mouth by the time. So what if that was the symbol that was just being chocoded here? Uh, like if it's a type 13 instead of 12, uh, then uh, there hasn't been time to classify that symbol properly. Uh, uh, so, so you need a space here in order to suppress that model looking ahead. And after you see why, you realize that that's natural. It had to look there because otherwise it wouldn't know to stop. But when we look at something uh, as a page as a whole, instead of one character at a time covering and uncovering, we get a different viewpoint sometimes as to what the, what the computer is going to do. So the, re the way it really works is symbol at a time. And, and if there was no space there, it would have to uh, different parts of it were, are all working on these things. So that's where some, some of these uh, mysterious um, phenomena occur that I think you might run into as you're solving those problems for tomorrow. <clears throat> One more thing I got to say about this before I go on, and that is um, after the after you get to a uh, after you get to uh, uh, the end of an if part or an else part. Let's take else as an example. Then tech looks ahead at the next symbol to see if it's a space or not, because spaces are, t are, are supposed to be ignored after, after uh, the right brace of an else. It's typically a nice way to end the line when you're, when you're defining things. And so it actually looks ahead to see if there's a space there. Now, um, sometimes this causes a mysterious disappearance of spaces. So like if you had a long macro and it ended right there, then, the out, then outside that macro, it might be pulling up a space from uh, that, that, that you didn't think was going to be called by the macro. For example, usually a, after a control sequence, a space is ignored. But if the control sequence has a, has a parameter, then a space after that parameter won't be ignored. So if I call somewhere CS of some, something delimited by braces, I don't expect the space here to disappear. But that space would disappear if that CS ended with an else that had no, and the else at the end of that control sequence would, would gobble up that space. Uh, uh, again, uh, that's, a, that's something that you'll probably only run into once a year, but uh, if you see a mysterious disappearing space, think about putting another space before, before you end that control sequence, because else always will look for a space there. And, and uh, if it doesn't find one, it has to back it up, whatever it found, and, uh, and, uh, pu and put it back. I think it even uh, might expand. A, uh, control sequence at that point, if it whatever it finds after it. So it's it's a, a, a precaution to put a space after after the uh, closing of an else. <clears throat> All right, now um, uh, recursion is the next thing I wanted to mention. Recursion is um, uh, is uh, uh, where a control sequence calls itself. And, and uh, it was after I had defined tech and when I looked at the first implementation that, uh, of prototype tech that had been made by Michael Plass uh, uh, that following summer, that, um, that I first realized that, that, that uh, control sequences could be recursive and that I would have to and, and f find, in fact, Michael uh, 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 was one of the people that opened my eyes the most on, what, on the power of these control sequences, his, his first test program generated an, uh, an almost infinite text and, uh, and, and it proved that my original ideas on the data structures were completely inadequate because, you, because I had to keep reference counters on the, uh, on the, on the, um, uh, on the expansions of macros uh, since uh, I can be in the middle of one macro and, and, and simultaneously redefining it, but the text of the old definition can't go away until I've finished uh, on a lower level scanning to the end of that macro. And so, uh, 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 so I learned this first uh, about six months after Tech was originally designed. But um, let's write a simple recursive macro. Um, let me to, to show you that it, that uh, that control sequences actually have a lot of the power of a finite state machine. Um, let me let me let me count how many periods there are in a row. Let's suppose, let's take that as a, as, a, as an example. And I'll keep on. I'll have a text that consists entirely of periods followed by some other character. Let's suppose, and and, and we just want to call the, the the count period macro. Okay, so define count period macro. 
and it's going to put the answer in count in counter zero. Okay. Um, okay. Now what I'll do is I'll start it out. Um, uh, count periods, and I'll start it out uh, by saying set co uh, not counter zero. Counter zero is the, no, no, normally the page number, so let's use count seven. So set counter seven to zero, and then um, and then call uh, say CP, which will be my which will be the recursive part of this that actually that actually does that actually does the counting of the periods. Okay, so now I define CP of one argument, and um, so that's going to that's going to read in the next symbol, either a period or something else. And so what it's going to start out is going to say if period number one, then do something else, um, do something else, right? <laughs> else finish the whole job. Now what I really want to do. Um, uh, this is uh, what I'm first going to write down is not going to be the final solution. But what I really want to do is. Um, advance count seven by one, and then I want to call CP again, and that'll gobble up the next period and keep on going. Else, I just want to, I just want to repeat the, the 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 thing that terminated it. I don't want to gobble it up. I want to repeat it, just saying that, uh, uh, and, and put it back into the text. So I've already done my counting, and that will stop it. Now this will be the this would be a, a recursive definition. Um, that that uh, that at least uh, intuitively solves the problem. It, it would it it says if you see a period, it, increase the counter by one and 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 try again, gobble up the next character. If you don't, then just re just replace the character you looked at. Um, but the problem is that yeah, you see what's actually happening when you watch these macros getting traced, and it'll trace the if, and it'll see and it'll see that these are equal and then it'll advance the counter and it'll call CP and CP is going to look for its argument. Well, its argument is this right brace here. That and it's going to give you an error message saying a right brace detected in unmatched right brace detected in an, arg in a, in an argument and uh, then it'll get all screwed up. In fact, you can even gobble up a right brace uh, after the word if. if, the, if when the word if is followed by right brace, you can get your, your brace structure all, all messed up. I hate to think what would happen there. There's probably uh, one of the error messages that tech will produce is called this can't happen. And it just means that I don't couldn't think of a way in which it could happen. But I think uh, maybe with an if followed by left or right brace, you can get things all screwed up. And please don't do that uh, ever. Um, uh, it might blow the fuse. OK, then. So CP would. would so how are we going to how are we going to solve how are we going to resolve that? Uh, that's the that's the intuitive way, but the real way <laughs> now that works is something like this. Okay, if you see a period number one, okay, let's advance count by seven. That's that's uh, advance count seven, and then I say g def not def but g def uh, next to be c p, and that closes the if. Now we say else, and then comes um, g def of next to be uh, number one. <clears throat> and finally, after we've done the if and the else, now we've safely recovered from all the uh, all this testing. Then we say next, and that's the end of CP. Now next is either CP again, which will now not gobble up this right brace. This right brace disappeared when I defined CP here. This is the, that's just the end of the CP list, and so that is ready to, to look at the next character of the text if it's CP. But if it's number one, it just repeats that and puts the, puts the thing back again. Okay. So that's a that's an introduction to a recursive macro, and uh, uh, one of our very first tests is, test cases was to calculate the GCD of, of two sequences of periods. Uh, uh, Jim? Yeah. I think there's one case where you can run into problems, and that's if the thing that immediately follows the period is a group. That's and right. Then you're going to have to right. I, I, It has to be, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, uh, if, if you put something in a group, if, if you put something here um, in, in, in braces, okay, uh, then that would would get would would get uh, uh, gobbled up here.
by next. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, brace, the, the braces get removed when that parameter is, is matched. And, um, and then you, get, you, you stick in several things after the period here. Now, um, it turns out that, that the way if works, um, oh yeah, that's for something I wanted to mention. The way if works, if the result is true, if the result is false, um, it will, it, it, the way it finds where the else is, it, it, is, it goes ahead until it gets to the, to the next right brace on the current level. And so this text, uh, this argument number one might, might be quite long. As long as it doesn't have any other groups inside of this group, um, it would scan to the end of that in, until it got to this right brace and then it would find the else okay. However, if this thing here started with a period, then this relation is true, and it will and it will expect to find a left brace immediately thereafter. Okay, and then it will start scanning that text. And you could even put in here uh, uh, s something followed by an else and uh, get things royally mixed up. Um, okay. Now, um, yeah, I'm glad you think it's funny. <laughs> and and then. Um, another thing that could occur is if you had something, you know, like X, at X, but you also have another, gray, uh, another brace in there, because that brace is going to be where it find, expects to find the else after in the, in the, in the false case. So, so the way if works is if, it, if the relation is true, and all, all relations actually work this way. If, uh, if uh, after you've scanned the part that, that def decides what the relation is, like there's an if to men, uh, and then you can give one dimension uh, equals another dimension, for example. There could be other garbage here if the relation is false. It's going to just scan until it gets to the, r the next right break uh, that's at level zero. Um, but uh, if it's true, it expects to find the left brace for the, for the thing immediately. Is there a question? Yeah. The way you've got it right now, the number one will match a period at a time. Is that right? That's right. Could, could you not also define it so that it had two arguments, a number one followed by number two, followed by some marking character which would be required to put after the sequence. You've got to watch out that these, that these that, that braces get stripped off after. So, so I would have to know some, some uh, terminating point afterwards. Suppose you had a, a, a specific character you'd use to mark yeah. the end. Then number one would match one period, number two would match the whole rest of them, and you'd just pass number two without to the recursive call. That's right, or I could pass the whole works again and make an n squared method instead of an n method sometimes in order to avoid a problem like that. But there's, a better, there's actually a better solution. This was just our first introduction to, to, to recursion, okay? And so I want to I, I talk about that. Can we pass these out? Everyone get a copy of this recursion paradigm. <clears throat> um, while we're passing it out, I want to show you one other, one other useful gimmick um, um, before we get, and that is uh, using control sequences as, as counters. Now there's there's ten counters zero through nine, and actually um, that's more than most people think. But people are afraid to use more than three or four of them for fear of running out. And and you cannot. But there's essentially unbounded number of counters because any control sequence can be used as a counter, and you and and it works like this. You define stole st stole count um, number one, number two, and um, this will take two arguments. The first one is going to be the name of a control sequence, and the second one is going to be the number of a counter. So a typical call on this would be sto count, um, uh, uh, pseudo counter, uh, uh, three. And that will set whatever is in count three will now be defined, pseudo will, will now be defined to be the value of three. And the way you can test that is uh, uh, to make it work in all cases, including negative numbers, we'll first test to see if the counter is negative. If so, we g def um, uh, our, our parameter one to be empty. Um, otherwise, we g def parameter one to be a minus sign. Uh, then we, oh yeah, before our getting out of that else branch, I want to set count two, set count of number two to negative number two, and that will, that will be the end of the else. But then I do an xdef, because xdef expands counters, and I xdef number one to be the current value of number one, which is set either to blank or a minus sign, not blank, empty or a minus sign, 
uh, followed by count two, number two. And then I've done everything except I, in one case I have to restore count two to its negative. And it's a, a neat trick for that invented maybe by Jim here, our TA, is set count number two, number one. This um, uh, uh, will now is, is the opposite of stole count. Um, set count um, three to pseudo is the, is the way of getting back the pseudo counter into count three. And, th and that's what this is doing here, in fact, to restore the previous value of it, because it's already, number one has now been xdef to be, well, let's take an example that the counter contains negative 123. Okay, then I gdef uh, pseudo to be, ne to be a minus sign here. Don't forget a space after what? I probably need a space in here somewhere uh, in order to get, in order to make sure that the number has ended. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I need a space there because it look for a space to, to terminate the number. Yeah, thanks. Um, suppose the counter was minus 123. So first I define pseudo to be a minus sign. And, I, and then I change count, count three to be plus 123. Okay, then I did an xdef of, of pseudo to be minus um, count three, which is now minus 123. And that gets expanded because it's xdef. Then my last thing says set count three to pseudo, which by now is minus 123 and it all worked. Jim, did I screw it up? Here. Okay, if you want the counter to have the space after it, I see that's safer, yeah. Okay, very good idea, put a space there. Thanks very much. Now, um, uh, except that that fails my next example. Hmm. If the space isn't there, no, oh gosh, maybe we can't have everything. I was going to define, I was going to now say if zero pseudo. Okay, I think maybe you're allowed spaces at this point before the left brace. Yeah, I think you are. Okay, so you're all right. If zero pseudo something else, something else. Now, if my idea, the idea is that if pseudo is zero, it will match uh, with zero. Um, and then, but it would be zero followed by a space, and, and I think that you can, it'll skip over a space to get to the left brace. Uh, but if it's anything non-zero, even though it's a long string of symbols, uh, we'll, it'll go into the else branch. And so this is a way to test a pseudo counter for zero that's, le that's legitimate. All right. <clears throat> but now to recursive paradigm. Time is... Okay, Before you uh, put that away, <laughs> on the xdef line, I notice uh, that you're saying xdef... Um, number one is, is number one from the argument to, to Stoke count, rather than using, let's see, and, but you've, and you've GDEF that before, so yeah. you're essentially referencing it by its name passed in, not by. Yeah, it's, 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 it's efficient. It, uh, I could have used another, I could have used another control sequence here. Yeah, but if you used you another know, control places. sequence there, on the xdef, then it would probably go off and try to expand CS given an argument. Um, uh, CS doesn't have an argument. Okay. So xdef will expand any any user-defined control sequence, including the one that was up here. And I think Jim did that just uh, because it was it was it was cute, uh, but also to show that you can define a control sequence in terms of itself. So a control sequence can grow. In fact, uh, I I use that in in exercise six, I, I define a control sequence to be something uh, more than it was before. If, don't you, uh, I presume you, you intend to have, oh, I wish you'd leave the screen if you would. Okay. It, you intend to have spaces after, uh, in front of your number signs, like for example, here, slash xdef number one, wouldn't you want a space there because of number one? No, number, the... number is, a, is, is, some, is, is recognizable as a non-letter. Anything that's non-letter can, can, after a control sequence of letters, you just have to have a non-letter to follow it. So you could put a space there; wouldn't hurt to gobble up the space. But the but the only value of a space after that is to delimit the the control sequence. Oh, I see. The difficulty would be is if if you were passing in sequences of characters from macro definitions, and you could absorb a character yeah, into the macro. Number one is that. But, but yeah. no, no. This this part of the definition. Uh, um, the rules for spaces are what the mouth sees for spaces. Right. It'll be scanned at that time, right? Okay, but number one is actually going to be a, a control sequence in, in the use of this macro. Okay, take a look at that. If you, I mean, I hope you've copied it down. 
the way it was before I, I, I garbaged it up. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, um, ask me after class and I'll write, rewrite it for you. But I've got to get to this recursion paradigm because that's the, this is a, a fairly general um, solution to recursion. <coughs> and, it, um, and last night, I, after, after an hour and a half, I reconstructed something that I had done in 1959 and had always wondered how I did it. Um, uh, and it had gotten forgotten in the meantime and the, and the, uh, and, and the simplifications of it actually failed. Um, so I, 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 it was urgent that I reconstruct what I did. Anyway, um, I, um, okay, so I just, the input basic, of course, is, is you don't have to do that to, to get recursion. Uh, but then I defined three magic control sequences, which one is capital T, which uh, stands for truth, capital K, which stands for killing, and um, capital TT, which uses two T's in its argument. And it looks for two t's as delimiters of arguments. You see, it has an argument one, and then ended by a t, and argument two also ended by t, and it, and it just returns the second of these arguments. So it's a sort of a half-killing thing. Now that's a very tricky thing, which I'll talk about in a minute. But first, let's just use this. Just give my. I just want to give a recursive paradigm. Um, now this is for a, a general class of operations where you want to give an, an, a, a lot of, of um, arguments to a macro. And, and the form of the, it will be the arguments separated by a delimiter. If the delimiter is, is null, then you have to modify this very slightly. But a uh, uh, list of, our, of one or more things separated by semicolons is the example I'm using here. So I'm using semicolon as a delimiter. And here's a typical call on, on recurse, uh, alpha, semicolon, beta, and recurse. Okay, but I'm, I won't allow anything in there. It can be groups, it, you know, it can, it, uh, all of that stuff. Um, uh, 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 well, no. If, you, if, if, if the whole thing alpha were surrounded by a brace, it would be equivalent to to, uh, to, to the to the other effect. And, and uh, there's a way around that too, if you need it. But but this particular definition will strip off uh, if the whole thing is is braced. Um, separate. So so it could say alpha semicolon beta semicolon gamma, or it could just say alpha all by itself. One or more things separated by semicolons. Um, and semicolon can be replaced by some other delimiter, if you like. Uh, but they shouldn't occur, of course, in, in, except in closed embraces within, within any of the arguments themselves. Now, um, uh, here's a way I can gobble that up. And, and the nice thing about this solution is that there are no forbidden, um, th there are no forbidden characters in alpha and beta. There's a forbidden control sequence only. This control sequence t, t should not be used. Probably none of these three should, should be used in, alpha, in, in, in the list of arguments. But you, it's easy to forbid control sequences from people. I mean, you, uh, I mean one of the, uh, it, you know, say that, the, uh, for example, one of the things I did was I changed the code of um, character 174 to be a letter. And then I, I actually define these control sequence. That's the vertical line. I actually define this control sequence to be T vertical line and K vertical line, and 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 uh, and while, when I did the definitions, and then uh, then vertical line was thought of as a letter, and uh, it's a, it's a, it actually fits right after Z a little bit, and so it'll print out as a vertical line and so on. But then after after I've defined all of my control sequences that that I wanted to be private, that no no user is going to match, then I change the code back of 174 back to uh, 12 the way it usually is, and. Um, and no, now, no user is, is going to be able to conflict his control sequences with mine unless he, he really tries very hard by changing the code back to 11 and <laughs> sticking it in again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, so, so there will be a forbidden control sequence in here, but not no forbidden character. Now, the solution that uh, someone said to problem six yesterday uh, was saying, uh, somebody said, C can, you, uh, you know, can you assume that there's a certain character not in the list that you could use as a delimiter to, to know when you got to the end? And, uh, and I said, yes, you could assume a dollar sign is not in the list. But the solution I'm presenting now, is re it doesn't have that kind of restrictions in it. Okay, so recurse, re recurse of one argument. Um, followed by end recurse. And so the argument is delimited by end recurse, and this uh, al allows you some flexibility also uh, in, in defining macros. Uh, in math mode, you can now tell the user that it really doesn't matter if he has spaces in, in, inside uh, because you, you, uh, uh, sometimes um, putting spaces between, between arguments can get 
tricky. So a lot of times it's nice to define a, a, a macro so that it has, uh, has its own delimiter at the end. Okay, then, then you do initial computation, whatever you wanted to do, and then you call recur of the whole argument followed by your delimiter and this, this, uh, this, this trick. Uh oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, so this will be in the handout for the people that don't see this, the rest of this on tape. Um, and uh, I also, there are people waiting in the hall, so I'm going to have to clear out soon anyway. Um, okay, I'll tell you what, how to read the rest of the handout. Um, I, I define this, and the, and the big trick occurs in this if test here. If t, 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 number one, all is jazz. And then I said macro trace, so you can see what happens. Now, macro trace is a control sequence defined in basic that will turn on the tracing of macros. And it turns it on almost immediately, but I had to have this blank, blank line in here in order to get it turned on. Otherwise, it would have read ahead and seen this word recurse before it was without tracing it. So that blank line was, yeah. so that's the, that time delay from getting from the stomach to the mouth. Anyway, they, they, this will trace macros, and, and then I, I have the call, the call. Now, you can watch exactly what happened. This is what the macro trace printed out of recurse, uh, uh, it prints out the, the name of the macro and what it, and this, this right arrow, what it expands to, what the arguments evaluated to. And you can watch, this is the kind of trace you get on your errors, t errors file after um, think macros are expanded. And finally, everything got printed. Then I showed you what, 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 got, what actually uh, the whole recursion expanded to. And this is initial computation, middle, uh, compute with alpha, middle, compute with beta, middle, final computation. And that's a general kind of recursion that will handle many, many recursive problems. Okay. Um, now, there's one more handout. That's the challenge problem that I promised you. Uh, you uh, the challenge problem we can talk a little more about on, uh, um, on tomorrow. But the, the main idea is, uh, is, I think, fairly clear. Um, I, I got your, your source file. I write the source file here, and there's a place where it says secret code to do this formatting. That's your exercise. Fill in what is it, figure out what that secret code was. And I give you uh, the rest of the source all written on here. So this is your challenge problem.